What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, um, some of the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. And today's guest, Don Yeager, I mean, if you haven't checked out his work, you probably have already read his books and you didn't even know it. Um, They're in your Audible queue, they're in your Amazon uh, cart. Um, And, you know, Don, I love hearing the journey, not like, okay, I've won 10 championships or I sold my company for a billion dollars, but the challenge story is really the grit. And, you know, um, I remember when I talked to Tony Horton of P90X, it wasn't, it didn't strike me that, yes, he sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X, but I loved hearing when he talked about he was a street mime. Like that's how he made food and rent money early on. He would put his hat on the street, he'd do street miming and that's how he'd make his money. Um, Rob Nelson of founder of Big League Chew talked about, he was like just hanging out in the bullpen. Like he wasn't being played. He wasn't making the career. Like he was in the minor leagues and he came up with this shredded gum that became a sensation. And so just hearing some of those journeys along the way. So check out that and more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you, before I introduce Don, today's guest, um, the episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help people um, basically companies reach their dream 100 referral partners and clients and relationships um, through running your podcast. Um, Podcasting is, I've not seen a better way of helping, you know, encourage amazing relationships, giving you relationships, creating a platform to give to your relationships. So if you have questions about it, um, go to rise25.com, email us. I've been doing it for over 10 years and I've gone to people's weddings, Don. I've formed business partnerships. I've gone on family vacations because of the podcast. Um, and so today's guest uh, is Don Yeager, okay? If you put, Don, I don't know if you know this, if you put your name into Amazon, okay, um, you have so many books out there, you get 88 results for Don Yeager. Great wow. teams, Thomas Jefferson, Running For My Life, Work Done. You have John Wooden, A Game For Life. You have Never Die Easy, Walter Payton. I mean. The list goes on. He's 11-time New York Times bestselling author um, with so many books, you can't even name them all. Profiled some of the top leaders, athletes, coaches, Duke basketball coach, Coach K, John Wooden, Walter Payton, Michael Jordan, many more. My personal favorite, Don, is uh, A Game Plan for Life, The Power of Mentoring with John Wooden. John Wooden, in my mind, is epic. I wish you know he was still alive. I would have a chance to talk to him and meet him. But um, thank you for joining me. I'm honored. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. There's so many cool stories um, that you have, I'm sure, from talking to these people and, and leadership lessons. And um, I want, I know people, the way they can engage with you is they can check out your books. You also have some online programs for people to check out Journey to Greatness and High Performing Teams. I was hoping that maybe some fun John Wooden story that you have and maybe some of your favorite sayings, John Wooden sayings. I think of his sayings every single day and they're because I listened to your book. So. Wow. Well, Coach Wooden had a a terrific impact on my life. Um, Had a, um, had a 12 year relationship with him that allowed me every other month for 12 years, uh, fly to California and spend a day learning from coach, which is pretty incredible. Incredible. Can't ask for a greater mentor. Um, when my when my son, uh, we were talking about him before the show started. My son's eleven, and when he was born, um, uh, shortly after he was born, one of the first le- letters that arrived here at our home addressed to my son was from Coach Wooden. Uh, it it hangs above his bed even today, just encouraging him on on how he might one day grow into the young man uh, coach would, would want him to be. Hmm. Um, uh, not any pressure in that, right? No pressure. There. <laughs> no pressure from um, birth. Right. And um, so he, uh, coach has had just great impact on my life for, for many, many years. And, um, and then we had the chance, we wrote a book together on the power of mentoring and, uh, 
and uh, that in itself was game changing for me because it allowed me to learn how to find a mentor um, and how to be a mentor, how to be a great mentee. Um, you know, uh, John Wooden had a very distinct style about mentorship. His whole belief was, I'll mentor you, but it's your job to come and to show up uh, well prepared, ready to learn. Uh, I'll answer questions. When you run out of questions, the session ends. And so that inspired me to do a lot of work on the front end to make sure that I was a good mentor, a good mentee. Um, and, How'd you uh, first meet him? How'd that come about? I actually had met him uh, through my work at Sports Illustrated. Um, but then uh, I had heard a story that he was serving as a mentor of sorts to a young uh, player for the Los Angeles Lakers named Shaquille O'Neal. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I knew Shaq and certainly his college coach, Dale Brown, um, who was a best man at my wedding and one of my best friends, reached out to Dale and, and Dale said, yeah. You, and, and so uh, I had the chance to actually um, listen in as Shaq and Coach Wooden shared a mentoring session. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of it, asked Coach Wooden, gosh, how does someone become mentored by someone like you? And, and he looked me in the eye and he said, you ask. And I, and I said, gosh, well, how many people ask? And he said, not as many as you might think. They think it's and, unattainable, Don? Correct, it, yeah. yeah. They, so they select themselves out of the opportunity to grow uh, before they ever, before the growth, um, yeah. for the water is ever even poured. And so, um, and uh, it was just a great lesson. A month later, I called and I asked. And he, I thought um, you were going to say you asked that second. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish, I wish I'd been that uh, prescient or that, um, I wish I'd had that, that level of chutzpah, but I did not. And so I, um, uh, it was a month later when I finally did. Mm. And he, his response was, I just wonder what took you so long. So um, at that stage we began, which was awesome. Talk about what you uh, observed in that mentoring session with Shaq and John Wooden. Well, I think the biggest piece was that it wasn't about um, basketball. Very little of it was about basketball. Um, it, much of it was about being a better father, being a better uh, teammate, uh, being coachable, mm -hmm. um, uh, leading others. How do you be? A, how can a, how can you become a great captain? Um, you know, so it was. It wasn't necessarily basketball. What it was was the ability to um, to translate the skill sets he was learning there into the life that he wanted to live, and so that became quite impactful. What did he say about being a better father? You remember? Oh yeah, I mean that the key to being a better father was to be present, right? And to not allow what it was that uh, that you did for a quote unquote living, right, um, to um, affect the way you um, came home at night. And we all do that, right? Coach Wooden worked diligently on that. Uh, in fact, his daughter, Nan, is one of my favorite people in the whole world, not doing well physically right now. But mm. um, um, but Nan, Nan used to say that, or has always said that when, when he would come home, when Papa would come home, we wouldn't know if he'd won or lost or if he had a good practice or a bad practice or, you know, well, he that was not the conversation that we, that he came home to have. So really important. Hmm. And um, from doing the book, um, what do you remember as maybe a favorite interaction or story as you're researching over 12 years? I mean, or maybe a relationship over 12 years, but researching the book. Well, I, um, maybe one of my favorites came toward the end, um, you know, 
I, every time I would leave his, uh, he had this little condo, right, that he lived in. And he, he lived in the second story and then he parked underneath. And, um, and so I would park in a parking space and I would come up to his condo. We'd do our thing and it would go for hours, right? He was like, he could lock in and be present with you for hours. And we would go together for a long time. And then, uh, and then I would, um, I would pull out of the garage and when I would, I'd look up and there standing on his back patio was coach Wooden who would have come out of the, of the condo or the little, you know, this place of living and this condo sounds far more uh, luxurious than it was. And, um, and he would stand there to make sure that I got a wave before he left. Right. Mm. And, um, so one day, kind of close to the end, um, I actually said, I said, Coach, gosh, you know, I have to tell you, every time I leave here, um, I feel like I'm a better man than when I arrived, hmm. right? And, you know, you say something like that to you or me, and we might, you know, oh, gosh, you know, that's such a nice, what, what kind words, really appreciate it, thank you. Um, Coach Wooden just looked at me and he said, um, I hope you make that your standard. Mm. And I was like, excuse me? And he goes, yeah, that when people leave you, mm. they will be better for the experience. Mm. And instead of, instead of just doing the humble brag, oh, thank you, he um, jujitsued it. And he uses it a teaching moment. He, taught me like yeah. are you gonna be are you gonna going to be that when people um walk away from time with you mm. and i thought wow there's a little pressure in that too <laughs> right yeah you know? and so um yeah so we 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 talk and think about that a lot yeah thank you for sharing that that's amazing actually and um you know your book and Wooden, favorite books of all time. And I always, his, his sayings always are in my head, like be quick, but don't hurry. And, and when everyone says, uh, you know, complaining about doing fundamentals, I think John Wooden basically teaching these pro athletes or future pro athletes, tying their shoes and putting their socks on. I mean, that's what I think of anytime someone says that. What do you have some favorite John Wooden quotes that, that ruminate in your brain? On a weekly oh basis. yeah, my favorite quote of all time is one he taught when he shared with me, which was um, uh, "Make each day your masterpiece." Mm -hmm. Right, and the reason that that quote is so impactful to me is because it um, it sounds so easy, right? It just sounds like psh, "Make each day your masterpiece." <laughs> how, how difficult is that, right? I mean, let's be honest, right? Um, it's actually really hard. What does the masterpiece day mean? It means you were well prepared. Uh, you delivered on every commitment you made. You were um, you were better uh, um, than you you delivered more than you promised. You um, uh, in all of these things doesn't mean you won at anything, right? But you had a masterpiece day. Yeah, and if and and. It's hard, but if you do it um, and you string a couple of them or you know, several of them together, you can have Masterpiece Week, right? That's a pretty good week. I'll start with an hour, Don, Masterpiece yeah. Hour, and then I'll go from there. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, but, so, but that was Coach Wooden's, one of his favorite quotes. In fact, his, um, uh, his uh, great-granddaughter, uh, Corey, who one of my favorites, um, um, you know, her, uh, her brother one day, um, wanted to make, was as all brothers try to do, get, get her in trouble. And, and so he, uh, he made sure that coach knew that Corey had gotten a tattoo in the previous week, you know, she was in high school and, um, and coach Wooden was oh, just so disappointed in <laughs> 
you know, my great granddaughter, a tattoo, honestly, you know, like those are things that you cannot undo and be careful and blah, blah, blah. And he asked to see it and she rolled her wrist over <laughs> and then said, make each day your masterpiece. Mm. And it was just this really wonderful, uh, very, you know, in which coach was like, uh, okay, I think I'll, I think I'll, I'll be okay with you right now on this. I'm going to like, let you. The only thing she could have put, they gave her a pass done. The only thing, right? Yeah, it was, it was wonderful, but it was one of those things where you, um, uh, yeah, it was very cool. So Don, at this point, how many books have you written? Um, cause I have an idea so, for your next one. Not that you haven't written enough of them. Like I would love to see a book of, um, each of the people have a page like Michael Jordan, Walter Payton, John Wooden, and your favorite quotes from them. I would love a book of, of that. Just that would be really cool. So how many books have you written at this point? Oh gosh. Uh, well, so, um, published and publicly available. I have 31. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, there have been some folks who have kind of commissioned me to, um, to do work for them that, uh, that they chose to keep. To it's their a ghost family. writing situation. Well, but no, they, they, they chose to keep the book, even though it's got my name on it. Mm. You know, as a, I mean, like the children of Stephen Covey, right hired me to work with Dr. Covey and all nine children to write a book that will likely never get published. Um, but it was a powerful and it's like impactful. a legacy book. Yeah. It's a legacy book. There's Got it. 200, 200 copies of it printed uh, and they will keep it within their family for many, many years to come. And mm, that's really cool. Um, and I'm honored to have been the chosen one to do that. So what are the other, if you can mention, what are the other legacy books that no one will ever read, but maybe we should? I, I, part of, you know, my commitment is I don't really talk okay. about those two cool. people because they, they're, 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 uh, they're reasons why each one of them sought it, chose it. Got it. I'm, I'm good to honor them. Yeah, totally. Um, so John Wooden and um, leads to Coach K. Talk about the relationship with Coach K and some of your your favorite leadership, you know, lessons from him. I, I think with Coach K, um, uh, he is, uh, you know, he's wooden esque in many ways um, in in his um, values based leadership model, uh, but not wooden esque in the way. I mean, he'll get in your grill, right? He will, um, uh, he, he will, he's, he's far confrontational. more fiery than yeah. Coach Wooden, hmm. even though, you know, in the, in the pantheon of coaches today, he, he wouldn't look particularly fiery uh, compared to some. He is, uh, he's far more fiery than John Wooden was, but he is a, um, yeah, he's very wooden wouldn't like in leadership in that he believed that, um, uh, that you, um, you have to, it's about communication and your willingness to require it. I mean, I love the way coach K he requires every player that he's engaged with, uh, to look him in the eye when they're talking, right. Mm. That's a, um, that's a key element is the, um, look me in the eye because uh, that's when I know the two of us are locked, right? When, when you're all over the place or paying attention to other things, um, uh, I, I'm not sure you completely, we're completely communicating, you know? And mm. that's an interesting, um, I love the way he leads that way. Mm. Um, and then favorite um, Coach K story from, again, the years of, of knowing him or chatting with them? Um, so probably one of my favorites would occur, would be, I'm so I love still to play the game of basketball. I, I live uh, in Florida, have a full basketball court in my backyard, right? With lights and 
uh, you know, in a typical non-pandemic. We're going to play uh, horse someday, Don, yeah, at some point. Yeah. In a typical non-pandemic uh, <laughs> world, I've got guys who play there several nights a week. Um, and I love to go out back and, and just shoot and play and run mm -hmm. the court all for a couple hours. But Coach K hosts an old man basketball camp every year um, that I have uh, that I've attended uh, for seven straight years. Mm. And um, and so just watching, you know, the way he very thoughtfully uses uh, you know, he brings together a hundred guys um, who are in their fields, pretty exceptional to play basketball on Cameron Indoor Stadium, which is pretty awesome. Hmm. But then he brings back all of his old players to coach us. And, uh, but the reunion aspect of it is huge and the genius in it, uh, A, there's the charitable model, which he, which he uses but you know he uses the money to f to fund a charity. But there's the second piece, which is the constant interaction of uh, his players and former players and business leaders. You know the people that that may one day have impact in the job market that they might be uh, going to work in. Ah, I gotcha. So you yeah, know, using this, you get to meet place, them, right? And, um, and they, the players are getting to meet people who are coming from a wide variety of industries. And um, if you've got questions like, hey, I'm considering going into uh, this business, there's somebody there from that business. Um, um, there's, you know, one of the great winemakers in America. There's the owner of the Boston Celtics, right? There's a, there's some uh, unbelievable uh, real estate tycoons. You could learn anything you want to learn it, it, over those uh, few days if you set out to want to do that. And, um, and coach pushes his former players to set out to do that. Like, just don't go hang with each other go hang as a community. And, um, and when you do it in, in uh, Durham, North Carolina, uh, you know, there's not a lot else to do. So it works out really well. There's a maturity about that, Don. Do the players even realize that that's happening or are they too focused on the present of like, I'm trying to make the NBA? So Coach, Coach K makes it a point. Like he's he does. not, this is not a hidden agenda gotcha. thing, yeah. right? This isn't a, uh, hey, you know, you open a fortune cookie and see what it says. This is, I'm telling you, mm -hmm. right, that even if you do make the NBA, most uh, NBA careers last this long, you know, you are going to live this long. Are you, what are you going to do with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that remainder and in that remainder, uh, I encourage you to make sure that you're building relationships. I, I got a, uh, I got a text message from one of those former players, uh, just, uh, just yesterday, you know, who's, uh, he was just checking on me and my family and uh, it's like, really, you nice. know, he didn't have to do that, but, he, but he does because we're, you know, we're in relationship and that's great. Don, there's a picture I saw of Michael Jordan and you're sitting in the picture with the basketball jersey. Yeah. Um, what, what was, paint the picture for me. What was the scene there? Jordan also does or did an old man basketball camp for a number of years mm -hmm. and um, uh, an invitation um, only basketball camp for uh, guys that he knew loved the game, but that um, all kind of came from same thing. Uh, and, um, uh, did it in Vegas. Now he did his in Vegas where there's a lot of opportunity for you not to be <laughs> engaged with each other, where you could go do all kinds of other random things. Um, but, uh, um, and so I, that was a picture from one of, uh, yeah, from the opportunity to go there and, and play. And the highlight of those four days for me was that I got to go 
uh, one-on-one with Michael. Mm. Uh, totally one-on-one with Michael, which is uh, a story I tell often uh, in speeches that I give to corporations because uh, uh, the, um, the victor at the end of the competition was not who you thought might think it was. What do you mean? Uh, I, 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 you're looking at the winner <laughs> of the competition between Michael Jordan and me. Uh, and, um, and, and if you watched any of the Jordan series and you saw the, the deep competitiveness of Michael Jordan. The last dance. The last dance. Yeah. You, you would appreciate um, that. He's not he going to let you win. Still to this day, asked me for a rematch. Yeah. Really? Yeah. To which I I will always refuse. I had <laughs> I had uh, uh, we had we had our we had our game and I um, I won. You so go out on top. I'm I'm one and zero against the greatest player of all time. Yeah, and I will and I will stay there. What have you learned from Michael Jordan from talking to him? Well, you know, I think what you learn. Um, it's funny because I, I, I do some leadership coaching and one of my coaching uh, clients was somebody I was on with this morning and, um, uh, and, and he has been riveted by the last dance uh, as well and was asking me about it. And, and, and he, would, he aspires to lead. Well, he's a great leader already, this, this coaching client of mine uh, of an incredible company. But in that world, um, he, he admires like what he learned about Michael Jordan. Um, but he worries that he's not anything like that as a leader. And, and I'm, and so I, I said, by the way, there's your lesson. You want to learn. The deal is that John Wooden, Michael Jordan, far different leadership styles, but both very successful, right? Um, there is no single leadership style um, that you should emulate, but you should study them all. And so with Jordan, right, Jordan had such an intensity about him, such a desire to win and to push others past their personal limits uh, that it, like my children have watched the last, watched the last dance with me mm-hmm. and, um, and they're young. I mean, we just got their 11 and 10. So they, you know, they did not know Michael Jordan as Michael Jordan, um, and, uh, the player. And so, um, they're like, Oh my gosh, wow. man, that guy seems mean. It's like, no. I mean, you know, mean maybe might be your way of looking at it, but oh, by the way, you know, that was how he pushed others and, you know, and, and there are others around who all have different leadership styles Yeah, and all of us um, need to make sure we're listening for and learning from uh, each and every one of those styles. Um, and let's, none of us try to go out and be, um, the, the second rate version of Michael Jordan, right? We've all heard that phrase. Um, our job is to go out and be the first rate version of us where we might have learned something from Michael Jordan, which is awesome. So that should be like, uh, the headline of your site. I beat Michael Jordan one-on-one. I don't see that anywhere on your site. I mean, that should be, no, that should be front and center, but you know, what's the best part is I have yeah. told that story so many times in, in corporate and in speaking environments. Yeah. Um, I, and I tell the exact story about how the, how the game went and how, you know, and our interactions show pictures of Jordan and I and all this whole thing. Uh, but I've told it so many times that um, uh, a few months ago, obviously at this stage, a few months ago, but um, my wife and I were flying through the Atlanta airport and some lady ran up and said, you're the guy that dunked on Michael Jordan. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, you know what, ma'am? Um, I'm going to just take that. 
It's I, an I, urban I legend. You're an it urban is. legend, Don. Uh, I am. I am. Uh, I, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to interrupt your thought right now. Um, uh, but uh, and, and I walked away and said, "Yeah, you know, the best part is at this stage, I don't even have to be the one to improve the story, right? <laughs> yeah, the story is taking on its own level of. Uh, I love it. And improvement. So, I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, growing up in Chicago, I saw that firsthand the last dance and, and the championships. And it was amazing to experience. And then now see the watch it um, and see the behind the scenes is pretty tremendous. Mm-hmm. How do you decide to write a book Don? I could see myself if I were you being like, Oh my God, there's a book there. This person would be great to do a book about this company, like the John Wooden. How did you decide the John Smoltz, the Dick Portillo? How do you decide I'm going to do a book? So it sounds super arrogant, and I hope that by the time your <laughs> listeners are done listening to me, they, they will get that it's not intended to be. But I think I have a pretty good um, uh, internal feeling about what would interest other people, mm-hmm. right? Um, and if I think a subject would interest others, it's not just a subject that's interesting to itself, right? Right. There are a lot of people I meet who are like, man, I'm an incredible book. You can't, what you, you need to write (laughs) my book. Um, And then you spend a little more time with them and you, and you know, they're not even a good obituary, right? Um, uh, Let alone 60,000 words. Um, So I have to imagine that um, who's going to, want to read the book, want to, want to buy the book. Um, I have to imagine listening to them after a few hours, uh, whether um, their stories will translate. Because there are a lot of people who have great stories, but yeah. they will never, they won't resonate or translate to other people. And a good book um, is a book where in your experience, I learn, right? And um, so that's how I do it. I mean, it's it's never a, I mean, there are a few people, John Wooden, right? It's an automatic, but there are many others who are, um, I mean, you mentioned one, uh, Dick Portillo, right? I mean, that was privately commissioned initially, and then he and then a publisher read it and said, man, we, we want to publish this. That's why I asked. Um, Even though you can't share, I'm like, I'm sure all of those would be, or maybe not all of them, but a lot of them would be amazing for anyone to, to read. You know? Yeah, and, and, and should they choose one day to go that route, yeah. they, they'll, they'll be available. But, but like Portillo, I knew very little about him other than I liked you know, um, his hot dogs whenever I was in Chicago. Uh, and then he reached, you know, his assistant reached out. I flew to Chicago and we met. And um, uh, after several hours, I was like, yeah, I, this would be like, I would enjoy this. this what was it about fun. that? Why did you, what was it about I, the interaction? I, I think it was, um, it was a combination of things. One was the American success story, right? I mean, I think that's always, um, you know, there's a reason why he was inducted into the Horatio Alger Society. Um, but the other is um, uh, so a, a particular interaction with him that was pretty fascinating was um, we're, we're kind of talking about this together. And I'm a Starbucks guy, like generally. And not today, but I, I, I have always been, um, and I have a particular drink, a particular way that I like it, right? And, and um, so it is one of those things where if you have that and you're used to that standard, and that's the best part about Starbucks to me, it's like several other really great um, organizations, consistency of product. And so... Um, uh, I had, um, you know, I had come by Mr. Portillo's place and I had my Starbucks with me and, and, um, and as we're wrapping up, he, he goes, you know, tomorrow are you coming back? And yes. Uh, he goes, Hey, um, 
I, I go to Starbucks in the morning too, Don. I got your coffee for you tomorrow. And I went, no, 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 Mr. Portillo, I appreciate it, but I'm good. I, I'm good. And uh, he goes, no, no, I got it. Like, I got it. And I'll see you tomorrow. And so I, you know, I'm sitting there going, that's nice that a guy that just sold his company for a billion dollars is buying me a cup of coffee, right? I like it. But no, I know what I want and I'm good. So the next morning I go by Starbucks and I buy my coffee. And I show up at his place and he scowls at me and he's like, Don, you know, I mean, you know, why would you do that? I told you I was going to buy your cup of coffee today and I promised you I'd have it here for you. I've been keeping it warm in the mic, you know, I mean, I've been keeping it warm for you since I got home at 6 a.m. this morning, got back to the house. Um, uh, and he says, um, uh, in fact, when you pulled up, I mean, I made sure to warm it up again. And I said, yeah, I, I get it, Mr. Portillo, but, um, uh, but I like a specific cup of coffee. Like uh, there's something, uh, and I just regular Starbucks coffee doesn't do it for me. I have a, I have a drink and he goes, Oh, I know. And I went, what do you mean? He goes, I fished your cup out of the trash can last night so that I could take the sticker with me to order your coffee this mm -hmm. morning and make sure I got you what you wanted. Hmm. And I thought, here's a guy, it's a billionaire, right? Who fished a cup out of a trash can to make hmm. sure that I was served uh, what I desired, not just a, not just a cup of coffee. Hmm. And you wonder why the guy's worth a billion dollars, right? That's amazing. Um, and, uh, and for me, like when I look at, um, reasons that that someone would be attractive to me as a as a partner in a project um it's a mindset like that that i'd love, love to learn from and understand where does that come from right that's not natural for everyone in fact it's natural for few um and where does that where where, where does that and i like to unravel and and as i do that then books become apparent to me. Yeah. Um, yeah and really you're spending, answer, you're so. spending a ton of time, energy and effort on this. So you need to be totally um, enthralled and wrapped in to the person and the topic and, and everything about it. Yeah. I don't work. I mean, I, I, again, sounds really arrogant. I don't, I just don't want to work with people who bore me because it, uh, uh, it gets old fast, and so um, the, to do a book, you you're truly investing in each other for a for a significant period of time. So, do you take breaks? Like right now, are you working on a book? I'm right now. I'm working on a whole bunch of them actually right now because <laughs> I can't where I would normally be on the road speaking right because this is uh, we're in the middle of uh, of lockdown. Um, uh, I, my pivot, like in week two of of, uh, of this, was to say I'm gonna. Most of my speaking engagements, where I, it's just what I've done for the last few years, uh, are gonna be virtual. Become virtual, right. and and we're, require less travel and other things. Um, I want to fill my days productively, and so I started. I I could flip the screen and show you, uh, but. Uh, I started reaching back to all these people who've talked to me about books over the years and just said, is now the time? And, uh, and a number of them said, yes. So I am, I'm actually engaged with a handful of folks wow. who I love. So most of my days are spent uh, in conversation with people who um, are enlightening and enthralling me. Who are the, some of the ones that you can talk about that we should be on the lookout for? Well, one is a professional golfer who I'm a huge fan of, um, who just, it, you know, it didn't have the right time in, in our previous five years that we've been talking about it. Uh, Bubba Watson, uh, who I just, he's one of my favorite people on the planet. Mm -hmm. 
and the opportunity to work with him uh, and to write his book is uh, is um, really really uh, incredible. And so very excited by that. Um, another one is with uh, um, uh, Jack Nicholas's son uh, Jackie the the second and Jack. It's a father son book. It's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, there's just you know uh, it's. Uh, it's fun. Um, Joe Namath, you wrote a book, Joe Namath, all the way. Talk yes. about that one. Um, you know, Joe, it was coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Super Bowl, and um, so there was an opportunity to uh, to work with Joe, and he's an intriguing figure to me. Um, uh, so I, I, I love getting a chance. To, I did not know him before working on the book. So he is one that where the opportunity to get, it was both an opportunity to learn from someone and really get to know someone. But yeah, I, I'm, uh, um, certainly a, a fan of Joe's. That's for sure. Um, why David Ross? Uh, David and I had a, um, uh, a friendship that extended back. We, we live in the same city. Mm. We live in the same little town, Tallahassee, Florida. And so kind of got to know him, uh, community wise, uh, over the years while he's bounced around the majors. And, um, so yeah, it just became this fun conversation around the idea that what made him special was his ability to be a great teammate. Mm. And so, um, and I, I wanted to understand that, like how do you, and, and ultimately it became this book that I, I has done far, far better than I think any of us could have imagined, but it was around the idea that you could become invaluable without ever being most valuable. Mm. And in that process, um, uh, you, if you were committed, it's, it's a book, you know, in, in, in other leadership spaces, you would call it about servant leadership, right? Um, in baseball, it's about being a great teammate. And, uh, but it's his journey to learn how to become a great teammate. He, he wasn't always that. And yeah. so that, that innate piece of it is what makes it so, um, uh, so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Being a longtime Cubs fan and watching the world series and seeing him, he's got a, you know, a special place in my heart <laughs> and everyone who knows who's seen that game knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. So. Um, who do you want to write a book about or with that you haven't yet? Um, well, from, from an athletic standpoint, I mean, the um, one that I have said for a few years would really intrigue me. Don't know how I'd ever get there, but is, uh, would be with Roger Federer. Roger Federer intrigues me um, hmm. uh, largely because, uh, you know, there's a guy who um, amazing uh, as an athlete, even um, – extended far beyond, I mean, he yeah, could have retired many years ago and just taken his cash and played dad and, you know, been a commentator, done whatever he wanted to do, but he still remains competitively, um, uh, juiced. And I like that. Right. I'm, I'm, uh, so anyway, Federer intrigues me. Uh, Derek Jeter intrigues me. Mm -hmm. Um, the numbers will never probably make sense for either one of them to do a book. Uh, it's not financially in their yeah. best. Well, sometimes people do them for different reasons, right? Yeah. To do a book though, to do a good book, you have to dig deep inside mm -hmm. of yourself and answer questions about yourself that aren't always um, the easiest questions to answer. And I'm not saying that either one of them don't have that, within them, but I, I don't, um, it may, you know. they may not be in the roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Roger Federer, Derek Jeter. I'm curious because Don, you know, you've studied and talked with so many people. I'm, I'm curious of who intrigues you for different reasons. So, yeah. So I mean, who else? Other, 
another would be uh, Tiger Woods. Um, but I want the Tiger today, um, not the Tiger that I knew back when I was at Sports Illustrated. I mean, I want the Tiger who is figuring it out and who, um, but, but again, got to dig deep, right? You know, that becomes the hard part in that conversation is, are you, uh, how deep do you want to get? Are you willing to kind of sit there and, and, and pull that and reach deep into your chest and pull that out? Yeah. You know, and you did one, um, which, uh, if anyone see the blind side, right? Mm-hmm. Called I beat the odds. How did that come about? So most people don't know that, uh, that Michael Orr, the player who was featured in the blind side, um, actually had almost nothing to do with the book written by Michael Lewis, who I have enormous respect for as an author. But, um, you know, Michael wasn't the actual featured story in the book, The Blind Side, right? It was a book about the left tackle position. It just happened that Michael Lewis knew um, the the family that Michael Orr ended up living with. And, um, but when the book and the movie came out and all that kind of became famous, um, yeah, the deal was negotiated with the family and so they did quite well financially as a result. Um, none of that was shared with Michael. Um, and um, uh, so there was, so Michael uh, didn't even go, wasn't even at, at the premiere of the wow, movie. Wow, right? that's insane. You know, he, he, to see the movie about his own life, essentially, he had to pay nine fifty and buy a bucket of popcorn <laughs> and wow. sit in the back of a theater. And, um, but out of all that came an opportunity for him to tell his story and he chose me to write it. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I fell in love with him and I still, uh, am, um, we're still close today. And, um, uh, he's actually another name that's on that board over there of books that I may be working on one of these days, uh, because there's a, I think there's a second level book uh, in him that will be really great. Out of your books, um, have you considered any of them turning them into movies? Uh, there have been several that have been purchased as movies, um, mm-hmm. including David Ross. Um, mm-hmm. uh, screenplays have been written. It's not my skill set. Um, I, you know, I, I, participate in the business deal of it, but not in, and I would, it's just really hard to get a movie made, um, which yeah. is amazing to have heard that and then regularly look at the board and realize there's a lot of garbage out there that I wouldn't go watch. Right. Um, so um, uh, it's, it, you know, I, I think there are a number, there, there are a number that could be movies one day. Um, as I said, several have um, the the rights to them have been yeah. purchased in the past. If you were to pitch one of them to you're in front of the producers, you're like, out of all the books I've written, this is the one you need to make this into a movie. What's that one that you would choose? It would be the it would be the book that I did with Warwick Dunn, uh, mm. the uh, the running back, um, uh, who um, amazing young man, but better than that, he. Um, uh, you know, when he was 18 years old, he just turned 18. He was the oldest of six children. His mother was a police officer in Baton Rouge and she was shot and killed in a robbery at a bank. Oh my God. Uh, he became essentially the father. He was the father. He was the man of the house, right? Raised his younger brothers and sisters while playing college football. Becomes a first round draft pick. Oh, begins a program starting to buy homes for women like his mom. Uh, just recently bought the 177th home wow. that he has purchased for for single moms. Um, That's amazing. 477 kids live in a house today, right. um, purchased by Warwick Dunn. And um, but to finish his book, uh, he and I went to death row to meet the guy that killed his mom. Whoa. 
And at the end of the hour, sitting there on death row, uh, which was in its own right an amazing story, uh, Ward Dunn looked at him and said, I came here today uh, to forgive you. Hmm. I was like, whoa. You know, I could go to the next 20 Super Bowls and never see a moment like that. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, that would be the movie. Yeah. Let's get it done, Don. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Uh, that is, what was it like walking down death row? being there in that environment uh it was uh, it was it was an intense it was an it was an hour of my life i will um that i would never be able to duplicate yeah so um don i want to you know first of all thank you Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for the body of work you've created for yourself and others. It's truly amazing. Um, you know, I'm an avid, you know, audible listener. I suggest anyone, you know, go to your site, go to Amazon, um, and you just type in Don, D-O-N, Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, or DonYeager.com, and check out the books, the courses, the presentations. You go into, I know, organizations and help them with leadership and, and everything. So, I encourage everyone to check out your what you're what you you're doing, and I figured talk a little about the online courses because people are love love consuming the stuff in an online course format. Um, you have journey to greatness and high performing teams. Um, maybe talk a little about journey to greatness first, and and what what people will expect or what's in there. Yeah, no, it's a. Um uh, it's a course that was built around, um, uh, the question my father asked me, you know, encouraged me when I was a, a young reporter, my first year out of college to always make sure that every interview that I did included a question I would want to learn from for me. Right. And, uh, so I built a question, which was, if you could name a habit, um, that, uh, that you believe separated you from others, what would mm -hmm. that habit be? And I got 2,500 of the greatest of our generation to answer that question over the course of a 30 year career. And so this is the, um, the top 16 answers, mm -hmm. uh, to that question and the stories and the lessons they taught me along that journey. And, um, and it's um, reduced into um, um, bite-sized pieces. Um, each day is less than 20 minutes of, of, uh, of learning, but with some action items and all the good things that you would expect from a course that you'd want someone to take. And um, so anyway, that's the, uh, that's the guts of that course. What's one that sticks out that maybe you included or didn't include in there? Because you can't include all of them. Uh, well, so I included the top 16 answers, yeah. which was the goal. Um, I think one that really, uh, stood out was the, um, the willingness to have, to, to think of yourself every day, uh, as a role model. I mean, you know, again, you go to the, the last dance reference and there was, um, uh, the, uh, you know, there was that whole piece where Jordan said, if there was something I regret, it's that I was held out as a role model, right? Because uh, it's so limiting in that, in that, you know, now you can't make mistakes because then, you know, all your detractors will say, see, I told you not to try to be like that guy. Um, but the truly great ones kind of want to be, mm -hmm. they appreciate, they understand it's a high bar. It's a pain in the butt. And, but it's also, um, it, it's, it, it comes with, it comes with the territory. It's responsibility. I mean, you talk about that in the John Wooden book where he comments about Charles Barkley. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's amazing. Um, so people can check that out. Journey to greatness on your website is they can go to yeah. courses that's on there. Yes. Um, and what about high performing teams? That, that course is coming. It'll be available in the next mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, by the middle part of the summer of 2020, um, we filmed it. It's being, it's been edited. Um, it's being turned into what a good course requires, but it's, it's based upon um, a five year run of uh, effort around the world to sit down with the builders of great teams and ask questions about how they created the culture mm. that allowed their teams to sustain excellence yeah. and, um, and then taking uh, those habits of those organizations and turning them into lessons yeah. and a lesson plan. Yeah. So, Don, I have one last question and uh, I want to tell people to go to donyeager.com. Where else should we point people towards to check yeah. anything out? I think that's, that's, the that's place? it. I mean, you know, yeah, everything is there. Yeah. My last question is, I guess, from your last question, which is what separated you? What's a habit that has separated you? Um, I would say uh, an insatiable curiosity. I, mm -hmm. I am... Uh, um, I once had a, a leader tell me that I possess a high CQ, right? A curiosity quotient. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so, um, I think that that's a valuable asset and for me. It's been, it certainly worked yeah. uh, to my advantage. When someone writes a book about you, Don, I know you have books about you. Maybe they <laughs> call it C CQ. The most important aspect to you for a lifetime of success. Okay. So that's my uh, working uh, title yeah. for you. Okay. But Don, it's go. been absolutely no one ever does that. I think in I think in book titles. So that's why I love your stuff. But CQ. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Awesome. It's been an absolute pleasure. I totally appreciate you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Appreciate you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.